remarkable experience happened with my uncle, Vernon Berta, a bombardier on a B-24, wanted to go back to the prison camps. He was interned in during World War II. He wanted to take a large group back so that they could celebrate the 50th anniversary of their liberation. And so, 125 POWs and their families, we went back. We followed their steps for 17 days. We saw Europe through their eyes and through the eyes of World War II. Now, it's happened this way for all of the POWs. They were flyers, they were allied airmen. From the moment they left the ground until the moment they returned to their base, their life was in serious peril. Some of them were shot down, some of them crash landed. At any rate, if they were POWs, they got on the ground somehow. Now, many of the men were pitchforked by the farmers who lived near the area where they bombed. They killed them with pitchforks. Still others, they were hung by their necks with piano wire on lamp posts, beautiful lamp posts, so that the terror fleegers, the terror flyers, who would see those bodies hanging would know that the Germans meant business. And still others were very fortunate because they were picked up by the Wehrmacht, by the German army, and they protected them from the civilians. Now, once they were picked up, they were taken by the Wehrmacht west to a place called Dulag Loop, where they were interrogated. The men were put into a small cell. There they had a metal bed frame with a mattress, a pot to pee in, and a window way up high. It was very, very uncomfortable because they were so isolated. And they turned the heat up, they turned it down, trying to make them even more uncomfortable. When they took them into interrogation, the men were shocked by how well the Germans spoke English and by the things that they knew about them, the men they flew with, and the men that were in charge of their operation. Finally, after the interrogation, and really they didn't get much from them, you know, the men could only say their name, rank, serial number, but imagine if you heard who your commanding officer was, you might flinch a little bit. At any rate, when they had sufficient numbers, the Wehrmacht again loaded them on a train and took them east to a place called Salaglu 3. It was 90 miles southeast of Berlin. It was a place surrounded by a large green forest. In fact, they cut the stumps out so they could, so they could build that camp. It was a camp that had five compounds, each compound surrounded by two fences of barbed wire. In between those two fences of barbed wire was concertina wire. They lived in drafty brown barracks about 200 men per barrack. You know, the, the British actually were there before the Americans. And so they learned how to survive Kriegi life. Kriegi, Kriegskafangenen is what the Germans called them. They called themselves Kriegi for short. At any rate, the British really learned how to do escape, how to bait the guards, how to just learn Kriegi life. One day, a German general came into camp. He was going to show the British, the British commanding officer and the British POWs, the value of German engineering. You see, he had a brand new custom sports car. It was red with yellow. It was a lovely car. And he told the German commandant he was going to walk in or drive it into the camp and show it to the POWs. Well, he did. He went in. He saw the senior British officer. They went in, they had tea, they talked about the air war. When the general came out, much to his rage, he found his car stripped. Anything that was removable was taken, including a briefcase that sat on the seat, the passenger seat. Now the commandant of the camp went to see the British officer, and he said, we can forgive the damage to the vehicle, but we have got to have those papers. So this wing commander, he had his men bring him the briefcase. He looked at every document, read every document, 
And on the bottom, in perfect German style, was a rubber stamp that said, anyone that read these documents had to sign it, is their rank, and the military branch that they were with, which the British officer happily did. <laughs> now, these British officers also taught the Americans about treaty cuisine. The Germans gave them a certain fare. <clears throat> it was black bread. It was very heavy and dense. It was made out of bruised rye, sugar beets, oak leaves, and sawdust. Sometimes they got a little margarine. They also received blood sausage and the favorite, green death soup. One day a man came to camp. He was new to the barracks. He sat down and he was given his tin cup of green death soup. It was comprised of woody root vegetables, the type you would only compost here. It had sometimes oxtail, many times it had horse meat. No, not many, but there was times when it had horse meat. <coughs> More than likely, there were maggots. So the new gentleman to the barracks he was picking out the maggots, thinking he could eat it once he got rid of them. Unfortunately, he went ahead and he pushed it away. And the man sitting next to him said, you know, in a few days, you're going to be hungry enough. You'll eat it. And certainly, that was what happened. Now, the International Red Cross provided these men with 11-pound Red Cross parcel. What this did was supplement their diet 1,000 calories a day. They got one Red Cross parcel per man. 1,000 calories is equal to two and a half, three ounce dark chocolate bar. Now, in March of 1944, there was a great escape at this camp. About 76 men got out. The Germans were very angry because they had to pull a lot of, of soldiers off the front lines to look for these men. And so they cut the men's ration in half, meaning they got one half parcel per man per day. Now, in the South Compound, which held only Americans, the commanding officer said, you know, boys, it's going to get worse before it gets better. And on January 27, 1945, the Germans came <coughs> in late in the evening and said, get your boys ready. We're marching out tonight. They could feel the Russians <coughs> closer than 50 miles away. They could feel the percussion of the bombs. And so the frenzy began. The POWs were trying to take everything that they had. They took a pair of pants and tied the legs together and stuffed it full of food and clothing and their Kriegi log, which was their diary. They tied the belt loops with a string so that they could drape that over their shoulder and carry their things. Some of them made backpacks out of a shirt. Still others, who had been there a long time, made sleds. And they marched out at 11 o'clock at night. It was the coldest winter on record. The temperatures were below zero. There were six inches of snow. The wind was blowing so briskly that it went through the, the inadequate clothing the men had and chilled them to the bone. The 2,000 men, 2, men in South Compound at Stalagu 3 walked 24.5 miles in 27 hours. They had one four-hour rest. They ended up at a place called Moscow. In Moscow, they were housed in a big red brick tile factory. They were so cold and tired, some of them had dysentery. Along the march, some of the men just sat down and died. At any rate, for 30 hours, they rested. And then their commanding officer said, there's 2,000 men coming in. We got to get you out of here. We got to move on. And they headed further west for another 15 and a half miles. They got to a town called Spremberg. And at a railroad, railroad siding, they were given a cup of barley soup. Some of the men said it was the finest food they had ever eaten. Right after that, they were jammed into boxcars. They're called 40 and 8. 40 ohm, 8 chevaux. They're French box cars, meaning 40 men, 8 horses. The floor was covered with feces from the livestock that had just occupied them. 
For three days, these men were in this boxcar, although they did have a little reprieve when they would get out, and along the siding of the railroad tracks, they would drop their drawers and relieve themselves and leave a field of green slime because so many of them were so sick. Now, there were 50 to 60 men in these cars. A few of them would sit down toboggan style while the rest of them stood because that's the only way they could do it. Finally, they ended up in southern Germany. They ended up in a town called Moosburg, which is northeast of Munich. There, they found themselves in a prison camp called Stalag 7A. It was a camp designed for 14,000 men, but then it held 130,000. It was an epidemic waiting to happen. The latrines were overflowing. There was trash everywhere. The men shared their barracks with lice, fleas, and bedbugs. The food was starting to run out. And my uncle said, he would have to go to the latrine. But he was sort of in suspended animation. And he said, you know, I would just sit there. And I would think about what I had to do. I had to get the energy up to go do it because I was so hungry. Finally, he was able to do that. By March, however, the Red Cross got some food into them, some parcels. And at that point, they got a quarter parcel per man per week. Now, on April 29, 1945, there was a skirmish that broke out between the SS guarding the camp and the 14th Armored Division of General Patton's Third Army. Bullets were flying everywhere, and the men ran and hid. They, they tried to get as low to the ground and get somewhere where, oh my God, the day they could be liberated, they might die. And then it happened. An American tank came through the front gates of the prison camp. My uncle said he turned around and he saw 10,000 men cry. Imagine seeing 10,000 men cry. Another fellow was hanging on, he and another a Scotsman were hanging on the fence, just looking at everything that was happening. They watched as the swastika came down the flagpole. And a flag four times the size went up. And all of a sudden, the wind caught it, and the stars and stripes unfurled in the wind. The Scotsman leaned over to the men, and he said, I hope you not think me unpatriotic, but that's the bloodiest, finest flag I've ever seen. And the tears were running down his face. These men, these air officers, were held at Stalag Luft III originally. It was the Ritz of prison camp. It was the best there were. The TV series, Hogan's Heroes, Hogan's Heroes, was patterned after this prison camp. These men learned the fine line between life and death. They understood it because every day they were in combat, they knew what it meant. They knew fear, and yet, they continued to go. They moved forward in their lives. They went for any kind of job. They went for their education. They changed our country. They put in the interstate highway. They put seatbelts in our cars. They were interested in ethics and medicine, and some of them built NASA. These men revered their families, their friends, their country, and their freedom. They knew what it meant not to have it. But they got through this with integrity, honor, and respect. They learned to appreciate and to value the simple things in life. They appreciated food a warm shower, a towel against their face. 
the smell of a bar of ivory soap, their bare feet on a piece of carpet, and imagine their attention when, almost as if the first time, a woman touched their hand. There are many, many stories, and I would like you to remember theirs today. I would also like to you, for you to think about the value that they carried with them, maybe for a day, maybe for a week, or for a lifetime, and have the courage and the gratitude to move forward in your life. These men survived prison camp. They taught me something. And they can teach you the same thing. That I, that you, can survive anything.